Welcome to The Whole View. I'm Stacey Toth of Real Everything, and I'm here each week to dive deeper into how we can find happiness and health inside and out through self-love, body positivity, and discovering new ways to be our best selves. And before we get started, a reminder that this podcast is for general educational purposes and is not intended to diagnose, advise, or treat any physical or mental illness. And while Dennis is a lawyer, he's not yours. So we always recommend that you see a licensed professional accordingly. And yes, I did just say Dennis is a lawyer. (laughs) Dennis Vetrano is joining us. He has 20 years of experience in the field of divorce and family law. And his social media presence on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube have hundreds of thousands of followers and his tips and insight into divorce and relationships, which ultimately is life advice we'll be talking about today. His podcast, The DRV Law Show, formerly known as Divorce Stories, helps guide people through their marriage and divorce journey and beyond. Say that three times fast. As we consider the lens of health and wellness, it is important to do so with considering relationships. Oftentimes, We talk about how important stress is on the health, and it would be impossible to not feel stress from different kinds of relationships, both positive and negative in our lives. And so I think oftentimes we're in the thick of emotional turmoil. It's harder to process big picture factors clearly. So I'm hoping that we can dive into a lot of that today to serve as a resource for listeners who may need it now or in the future. I also want to share a little bit about my own kind of personal perspective for you to have, Dennis, which is that I've been married for 22 years. Well, I've been in a committed permanent relationship for 22 years. We didn't get married until federally everybody could get married. So I honestly don't even know. I think that might be like 17 years or something like that, but that's not when we celebrate. And When we were going through the pandemic, like many couples, we had strains in our relationship that were more difficult than we encountered previously. We had death in the family that was like losing a child. Matt's brother, who lived with us for 15 years, passed. And then we became foster parents. And going through those changes of all the pressure of those things, the grief, and then the pandemic on top of it, our relationship was really put to the test. And I wasn't sure that we were going to make it through, but we did. And that was not without work and a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today. That said, sometimes relationships, the best thing for people is to not stay together. And so my life experience and story is not the same as someone else is. And I just want to lay the groundwork that I'm sure you're a divorce attorney. And so I I know that obviously that's something that is helping people in certain sort of circumstances and ways. But there are also a lot of things that you've seen that could avoid difficult circumstances or make it easier for people going through that process and alleviate some of the stress, which we'll talk about today. So I'm wondering if maybe you can just start by introducing yourself a little bit, and then I promise listeners I will share a little bit from the scientific perspective on why this is relevant before we jump into the show. Well, as you said earlier, I'm a a divorce attorney, and I've been practicing family and family law and divorce for closing in on 25 years. And look, I've been involved in the courtroom. I've prosecuted child abuse and neglect. I've represented kids. I've seen marital splits from every angle. And what I discovered over time is your life in a divorce is like your life under a microscope, right? You're forced to hyper analyze everything, the way you're parenting your children, how healthy you are mentally yourself, how well you check in and engage with your partner, you know, what your finances look like. Are you happy with your career? I noticed all of these things that we go through in the divorce process that we don't unless and until we're forced to do it in the divorce process. And I thought to myself, why aren't we using this divorce process, all the things that it teaches us and helps us teach and learn and grow through the process, hopefully, why aren't we doing those things outside the divorce? Why aren't people knowing themselves better before they try to find a partner? Why aren't we finding our best career and pursuing the the things that we want to pursue 
outside? Why aren't we paying more attention to our finances? So for me, when I started delving into it's kind of a spin off of the advertising that I've been doing for years, but now it's the most engaging thing, most enjoyable thing that I do is I started just putting out videos on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook about how to live better, how to live your best self. And sometimes that's getting divorced and improving yourself through the process and improving your life. And sometimes it's just working at your relationship or self-reflection or chasing a new career or improving your finances. So just wanted to try to put as much content as I can out there to help people improve what they're doing, to live a happier life because life is short. I think the idea too that oftentimes when we go to sell a house, we like clean up, we declutter, we renovate a little bit. And then we're like, why didn't I live like this the whole time? Like, right. And so yeah. it sounds like that's a lot of what you're describing about the experience that people are going through when you're forced to think through all of these things in your relationship. I think oftentimes we think, oh, that's really what the root of the problem is or whatever the case may be. And if we are able to catch it on the front end, then you could potentially alleviate a lot of the health and wellness negative side effects that do come with or are associated with divorce. Now, of course, if you're in an unhealthy relationship, especially if there's any sort of abuse or anything like that, the statistics of making yourself better by getting out of an unhealthy, toxic relationship is super important. And at the same time, if we are in a situation where people are willing to work on themselves together, you can avoid a lot of the statistics from divorce. So as a child of divorce, I've always said, I'm glad that my parents were divorced because they never would have gotten along. And it would have been way worse for me as a child than if they would have stayed together, which is the flip side of the coin for my husband and I have been willing to work on ourselves and our marriage in order to stay together because we love each other, because we're best friends, because we want to be together, not just for the children, not just for the sake of being married. And I think yeah. there's a lot of flexibility between everybody's individual circumstances. But I do want to share some of the statistics for people who might not know that divorce is one of the most difficult things that you can go through in your life physically and emotionally. It ranks up there as one of the most stressful, impactful on your health and wellness. It can increase anxiety, depression, and loneliness. It can decrease self-esteem and increase feelings of insecurity, and especially true for children who experience divorce, according to the American Psychological Association. And then there's a lot of different studies that I'm going to pull some statistics from, and we'll link all of them in the show notes. But Research actually shows that decades after divorce, you can have serious chronic health issues from them that divorced people, both men and women, years after their divorce, suffer from higher rates of mortality, depression, illness in general, and substance abuse than do married people. And according to Johns Hopkins, they did a study of people who were either divorced or widowed, which is its own incredibly painful process that 20% are more likely to suffer from long-term health problems such as heart disease, cancer, diabetes, digestion, or metabolic problems, as well as other chronic health issues, and 23% more likely to have trouble with mobility, such as walking or climbing stairs. And people who remarry somehow have less of that, but still have that increase. So 12% more chronic illness and 19% more likely to have problems with mobility. So if you are finding a partner after divorce, it alleviates some of the stress that still lives in your body, but the divorce itself does take a toll. I was honestly struck that the mortality rate for divorced men is nearly 250% greater than for married men. So I'm going to say that again, because that is a really high statistic. The mortality rate for divorced men is 250% greater than for married men. And divorced men suffer more heart attacks and strokes than non-divorced men. And women also have an increased risk of heart attack. But after one divorce, the risk of heart attack increases 24%. After a second or more divorce, 
it goes up for women even more to up to 77% increased risk of heart attack. So when we're talking about divorce and relationships, of course, being in a stressful relationship is going to harm your health. And perhaps if you are able-bodied to begin with, your divorce is what's maybe your divorce is more likely. And that's why some of these like mobility things are happening. I didn't like all the way dig into these studies to see how much is correlation and how much is causation. But we undoubtedly know that stress negatively affects our health and that divorce is one of the biggest life stressors. So I wanted to be able to have a conversation about what are some of the things as someone who is witnessing people go through divorce over and over again, the lessons that you, Dennis, have learned being a third party witness to what I imagine is sometimes the growth that people are going through. It's like they're already down this path of like being pot committed towards divorce, but then also going through their own personal growth journey and people have these positive outcomes, but then also this really negative kind of possibility that comes when you hear about very toxic divorces and people are not amicable and and all of those things and how we can all, as it might potentially happen to us or to friends or or whatever the case may be, learn from your advice, right? Like the lessons you've learned. So maybe you can start with sharing some of the personal experiences that you've had in working with couples and have you seen any of their health be affected like in the process of what they're going through? Yeah, I'm not privy to people's medical records post-divorce to see, even to have a baseline to determine what their health looks like post-divorce, but I can tell you what I see in dealing with them. And I will say that with the guys especially, and I do think, again, there's not everything is can be painted with a broad brush, but I think more likely than not with the guys, they don't really have the support systems, right? They don't seek out help. They don't have a lot of like the guys, a lot of the guys that I'm dealing with, they don't have a lot of their own friends. They don't have a priest or a pastor or somebody that they talk to. They don't have a counselor. They don't need help. I don't need anybody to talk to. And sometimes when they're not having as much family time with their wife and with their kids or with their husband and their kids, that's such a huge stressor for them. And that is their support system. And I think we as guys, we don't make a conscious effort to seek out a support system. In my experience, the ladies that I've dealt with are better at that. They're a little bit more self-reflective. They're a little bit more introspective. They're a little bit more okay with saying, hey, I'm not okay. I need somebody to talk to. And that's what it's about. I think it is one of the top Or when the polls that have been taken over and over again, it's one of the top four scariest things for people in their entire life and death is in there with it, is a divorce. So think about it like that. But I think the advice to be gleaned from there, look, you can't undervalue how important your mental health is for your physical health. If you're feeling well mentally, you're much more likely to be healthy physically for a number of different reasons. So what's the lesson there? The lesson, and again, we, we always had such a stigma with divorces that people don't want to fully embrace it. It's a process and you need to like, it, it's any major process. What are you going to do? You're going to prepare for it in advance. And it's going to walk in and say, hey, I'm going to take on this major process just right off the cuff. No, you're going to prepare in advance. So now that there's more information out there and there's more help, what's the message? What's there to be learned is to start the process preparing for it. And it's not just about gathering tax statements and documents and stuff like that. It's about knowing who your support system is. Like if you needed something, who can you talk to? Who can you trust? Like who can you lean on? Who can you spend time with? Because it's an emotionally taxing process. Even the cases that I've had where I have one spouse that loathes their spouse on the other side. And and I do get a lot of those. They just can't stand the other person. They can't wait to be away from them. But going through the process of the split and a huge change in your life is still extremely stressful. So the starting point there is to really create a support system. Friends, counselor, and especially if you're in an abusive relationship, having a counselor who's well-versed in abuse and how to help you through it. And that's the nuts and bolts of it. Again, if I'd say anybody who's in earshot of this, if you're in an abusive relationship, 
hashtag the hotline, reach out for help. Do not hesitate if you're in an abusive relationship. Let's start there. But in terms of moving through the process, having support is the most important thing. It's interesting as you were talking about the different ways that most women and most men process this change. It reminds me, actually, we had a podcast last week where we talked about a psychiatrist was talking about kind of the neurological and biological differences as it relates to women actually being more accessible through estrogen to their own emotions. Like literally we can access them more than biological men and how that would manifest in the ways of women in a divorce having more of a support system, right? Like being aware of their emotions and then asking, having more of a support system and societal structure to ask for support yep. with that and how that would lead to better outcomes for women physically who go through a divorce, which is what the statistics yep. show us, and how men who are less encouraged to tap into their emotions and have less ability to feel anything but anger, really, by society is then leaning towards, let me grab all my tax documentation and protect this kind of stuff, have a better outcome for financial outcomes with a divorce, but have worse outcomes from a social and emotional and health perspective, right? Like you see, right. as you're talking, I'm like, oh, that exactly explains the manifestation of where the statistical outcomes of men versus women going through divorce are. And I appreciate you calling out not all not all divorces are heteronormative. I know we're right. referring to them that way. And obviously that is not the case. And at the same time, I would like to think, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but non-heteronormative relationships probably have a statistically higher improvement in terms of how those relationships process through a divorce in terms of the butting heads and the like violent nature of emotions can imagine as being more difficult with men and women who process things very differently than if someone were in a same-sex relationship. You you have the ability to process emotions more similarly to someone, and so therefore it would be less volatile, um, is what I'm imagining. It can be, but I think you got to remember the percentage of same-sex divorces that we do in comparison to heterosexual relationship divorces is there's a different percentage. There's just a different amount. But I, I think the, the dynamic is definitely different, but we do have those contentious. Is the processing different? I'm not quite sure, but we do have contentious relationships with the same-sex divorces as well. So uh, you raise a good point, though. I think you talk about like being forgive the uh, expression successful through the divorce process, life emotionally, and then successful in the financial aspect of the divorce process. So guys, I think the reality is what I want people to focus on is, and not that I'm saying forget about the money. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is at the end of the day, the most important thing is to improve yourself and come out the other side mentally and emotionally healthy. Do you want your lawyer to help you deal with the numbers and the finances and, and be in tune with that and be involved in the process? Of course you do. But I want you to focus on big picture. The big picture is the most important thing. Learning about yourself, learning about the relationship, learning what you need from another partner when and you get out of that divorce process, building your new life, turning a page. It's a start. It's supposed to be a start of a new beginning. And it's not to say that every relationship needs to, that has problems needs to lead to a divorce. That's not what I'm saying. Some are workable and they should be worked on. Like yours is a perfect example to say, hey, we're committed. It wasn't just staying for the kids. We're committed to each other. We love each other. And, and listen, it takes work. And sometimes those external stressors are going to be off the charts. And that's when your relationships are really tested. And if it's worth staying, you'll know it's worth staying and you work on it. But if abuse, et cetera, it, it's not going to work. And the only way to improve your life is to get out of it. The big picture is the most important thing at the end of the day. You need to be on the other side mentally and emotionally intact as much as you can be and learn and grow and move on from it. One of the things that I think is having a societal awakening right now, I'll phrase it that way, is this idea of 
undue burden of invisible labor. So this emotional burden of things that especially women in heteronormative relationships are doing, being the primary caretakers while also often working, while also being responsible oftentimes for the majority of the cooking and the cleaning and all of the things are burning women out. Like we heard so many statistics, especially through the pandemic. And now we're having more of a social discourse about this in terms of even just the simple things that you see on like TikTok or Instagram of like women being like, yep, and here's me doing this task and this task that nobody else in the house is doing on top of the working and the all of these kinds of things. I'm wondering how this shows up in the relationships and conversations that you're having. Are you finding that there's a theme of men not fully participating in the relationships and that being a cause for a lot of modern divorce? Well, let's put it this way. My parents are going on being married something like 50 years. I've been married going on like 17 years. Okay. So clearly I believe very strongly in the institution of marriage, but I believe it needs to be a partnership. So what I've been seeing lately through my office, again, we're multiple lawyer, multiple paralegal law firm that does, that handles a lot of divorces. We're a high volume divorce law firm. That is becoming the biggest trend. Literally the single biggest trend. And so, so why did I lead in with my belief in marriage? Guys think when I come out and I tell them this, you're just beating me up. You're just, you know, oh, sure, it's all my fault, blah, blah, blah. And if you look at the comments on, I put out a few videos like that on social media. If you look at the comments from the guys about that, watch how defensive they get, um, which is another asterisk that we can circle back to that. I'm not here to beat anybody up. I am here from what I've learned as a divorce lawyer and doing this going on 25 years to give you the knowledge and expertise and experience that I have so you can improve your life. If that means being a better husband to your wife, okay, in a heterosexual relationship, if that means taking on more responsibility, if that means being a true partner, if you need to hear me tell you straight out you're not doing enough, it's not good enough, so that you change, and you stay in a relationship that's worth staying in for both of you and for your kids, then it's worth it. And if you're going to call me names or do whatever you're going to do because you get defensive about it, hopefully if I keep saying it enough and enough, we're going to get the message. Because that is a huge theme. It can't be. And the funny part about that is I think that guys, they don't realize. And not to say I don't want to obviate any blame that they have there because the blame falls squarely on their shoulders. They, they need to see it and be more in tune and do more. But they don't realize if you were more involved, okay, mom comes home, right? She makes lawn, she d makes the dinner, she grocery shops, she does the laundry. She's also working 40 hours a week. She's also, you know, a manager at her bank, making more money than you are. And you're just sitting there on your phone playing around. Those kids are in tune with her. Those kids know, okay, positive or negative attention. That's how kids function, right? They know they go to mommy for everything. And that relationship with mommy is like this. Dad, you start taking on some of those responsibilities, watch your relationship with your kids strengthen and watch how much you get back as a dad. All that, because listen, kids are like a bank. The more you put in, the more you're going to get out. You start taking on some of those responsibilities, you start taking them to sports. You start making some of the dinners. You start doing some of their laundry. Those little things, seems like it's not much, but the kids see it. They know it. That's how you build your connection with them. And the guys glaze over these things. But you know what? You want to be like this with your kids? Because I know for me, that's that, if not the most important thing, is one of the most important things in my life to be close with my kids, to have that relationship, to have that bond. That's how you do it. But yeah, ladies are doing it all. And, and we got to do better as guys. And it's not every guy. I don't like, again, like it's not an overgeneralization. It's not every single guy out there. There are a lot of great dads who are full partners doing half of everything or really pitching in with everything. And it's not always going to be 50, 50. Sometimes a perfect example is my relationship with my wife. Sometimes she carries me. Sometimes I carry her. Sometimes she does a little bit more. Sometimes I do, but we're always engaged with each other, knowing we're each making contributions towards the similar things. And that's the funny part about that too, is that's how you gain connection. 
Like, how are you going to be able to come in from the end of the day or when you're ready to go to sleep at night and say, oh, man, it's tough with the kids today. Oh, I had so much laundry to do. Oh, man, cooking or I couldn't find anything at the grocery store today. If she's talking to you about that and she's like she's speaking Swahili or a different language and you don't get it, that should be a message. You should be able to bond on those topics because you share your experiences through them. But if you have no experiences, you have nothing to share with your partner. I think the other part of that, too, is the ability of partners to communicate when you're feeling frustrated about those things. And that was something that has yep. been really an evolution in my relationship and learning what I needed, because as someone who's done a lot of shows talking with mental health experts, one of the things that I know to be true is that we go into relationships to repair broken things from our past, whether that be parental relationships or some sort of other romantic relationship that you're trying to fix. Your brain is literally seeking something out to fix and repair something that didn't go right the first time. And so as someone who got married at a young age, I chose a partner who I wanted to fix something that really was unhealthy for me to want to fix him to begin with. And so women were not always in the right on all of this stuff, right? Like oftentimes we think that we can change a person and that's our goal. And that I, I'm sure you're nodding your head for those people that can't see is not a good approach in a relationship to be like, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go into this relationship. And no. my goal is to like change a person. And that was my relationship with my husband. It's like, I thought, oh, I'm going to fix this thing that I experienced as a child in not having, not getting X, Y, or Z as a child. I'm going to find this relationship as an adult, and then I'm going to fix it. And I'm going to change this person. I'm going to get my needs validated from this relationship. And then the older you get, the healthier you become, The especially when you have children, and it becomes like a, they're a mirror looking back at you and <laughs> like your own. You're like, oh, I don't want to put that on my kids, right? And becoming more aware. And so you go through this journey. And if we weren't talking to each other all along the way, and I wasn't saying, actually, what I need in this moment is for you to validate my emotions. Like for me, when there is an invisible labor that I feel overwhelmed by, which is usually what happens. I live in a house of neurodiverse people and it's on me to like, he, I am the glue that keeps everybody together because they're all 80%ing everything all the time. That's just how their brains work. It's magical in other ways, but when it comes to detail oriented, like home stuff, it is not. And so sometimes I'll be like, I am running a business. I'm running the household. I'm helping the kids. I'm doing the meal plan. I'm doing this. Can you please just do the meals without me reminding you to get dinner started? Can you please just do the laundry and mow the lawn without me saying the lawn needs to be mowed? Like th that particular thing, just telling you to do it feels overwhelming for me. Can you just make Wednesday's mow day? Like whatever it is. And that is a game changer in my relationship. Maybe it isn't for everybody, but I think communication, whatever that looks like in your relationship, if you're not having a conversation with someone to say, I feel overwhelmed that I'm doing all the things that I'm watching you play on your phone and it's making me resentful. Like if you can't have that conversation with someone, then you're going to end up in a situation of all of these negative outcomes we mentioned earlier. Right. And I think a lot of times what I'll get from the ladies on my social media is they'll say, hey, but he should know, but he should know. And I, and I get it. I agree with you 100%. If he doesn't know or he's not saying anything, you need to communicate it. Now, a lot of what we'll, what we'll see is they'll say, hey, but when I communicate it, he'll get defensive, he'll walk away like, okay, but then that should be an indicator to you. You should be able to communicate your feelings and be able to express how you feel. And the reality is your partner also should be in tune with you enough to notice those things. It's funny because communication is one of the most important aspects of a relationship, the back and forth. But it's not, it, the words that you speak aren't as important as the expressions on your face or the way you carry yourself or the inflection you use in your voice. Those things speak volumes. So I'll take that one step further. You should be in tune with your partner enough to know 
if they're walking around with a frustrated look on their face, just ask. Is everything okay? Can I help? That goes miles, hundreds of miles in a relationship. And even if it isn't, and even if it has nothing to do with you, and even if it has nothing to do with the kids or the house or whatever else, you're showing you care enough, you're concerned enough about the way they're feeling and supporting enough to want to know. I agree. So. I wonder if there are inflection points that people have shared with you where it became like a red flag moment, right? You mentioned earlier, like an asterisk to come back to, but right. Like, are there these moments in people's relationships where there was a moment or there was something that they felt deeply like this is no longer recoverable. I am no longer interested in making this work. And if so, how can we potentially look for those and work through them if we want to continue to be in a happy, healthy marriage versus letting that tidal wave take us over and riding it into divorce? Well, it's funny. I, I wish I did have a sort of a, a major indicator, a red flag moment for people. But I find that with people, what ultimately leads to the final decision on whether to pull, whether or not to pull the trigger on a divorce case are relatively innocuous things. And I think the, the indicator there and the lesson to be learned there is because we just continue to tolerate the things that we know are not workable over and over and over again. My experience in dealing with ladies in the at least in the heterosexual relationship realm, is that they spend a long time really tolerating things and not communicating with their spouse. For one reason, and I think a lot of it is because they'll say something and it'll just be ignored. And they'll say it again and then they'll get defensive. And then they'll say it again and it'll be ignored again. And then they just stop saying anything. They stop saying, hey, this is blah, blah, blah. This is bothering me. This is and there are things you can work with a counselor to improve your communication skills between the two of you and how you interact with each other, how you communicate to help improve the productivity of those conversations. But I think what happens is it's just, again, you take the example of the ladies doing everything like, hey, I need you to help. Hey, I need you to help. Hey, I need you to help. And just either ignored and then it becomes, I think sometimes they feel like it becomes white noise for their partner. And it just, it's months, it's years that finally just one little last thing and like, that's it. It's finally, I'm done with this circumstance. How many of those could have been workable relationships? Who knows? Who knows? I think, again, that's why a lot of what I'm saying is trying to help people improve their level of communication and trying to... The prototypical divorced guy that I get is, like you said before, I think angry. Angry. And at the end of the day, they, many of them will say they feel blindsided by the divorce process. I didn't know it was a total surprise out of completely left field. And the ladies are like, were you there? Like, were, were you in the same relationship? Like, how, like what? But I also know that they're, for most of them, their only support, their only connection is their family. And they are devastated when they have to leave. It's a legitimate level of devastation, which translates into anger, because that's the emotion for a lot of the guys that I see. So how do you catch that before you get there? Like, how do you cut that off at the pass? Like, I think also there's value in gratitude, right? And I think modern culture, we tend to not realize what we have until it's gone, right? Like that saying is there for a reason. And yep. I'm, I'm seeing you clap because I'm assuming yes. that in a lot of these cases, especially where someone is feeling blindsided, it's like you didn't stop to appreciate what you had. And clearly you wanted it if now you're feeling blindsided and angry that it's gone. So one of the things that occurs to me is this idea of gratitude. And I know for me that was incredibly helpful in my relationship because as I was sitting down, my husband and I physically separated. Like he moved into a different oh, room okay. in the house for a while. And I remember just feeling like I'm not getting the sense of relief that I wanted. I'm not getting the sense of like, because I was feeling like I'm doing everything. I might as well be a single mom, single parent, whatever anyway, right. and not have to deal with the frustrations that I was feeling from my partner. 
And one of the things that I sat down to do was like, what are the things that I miss about my partner not being here and as present and available to me? Like I miss our conversations. I miss different kinds of things that were important to me about my relationship that had nothing to do with the dishes weren't done or you promised me you'd do this and you didn't do it or blah, blah, blah. And it was like, okay, am I willing, me, not what am I expecting someone else to do to change? Am I willing to accept that this person is never going to be consistent with some of these things that I want him to be consistent with because he's neurodiverse, because it doesn't matter to him the way that it matters. Am I willing to just accept that these are things that I need to stop changing? These are things that I need to stop asking for. And in return, then what could he be successful at that I can ask him to do instead? Could he be better at validating my emotions? What I really appreciate in this gratitude that I'm doing is the conversation that we have. Could I start asking him to validate? like, gosh, it's really really hard that you're doing so much. Like, I see that. And like, I'm going to pick up the slack in these other areas. But like, knowing that I'm a control freak and that I want things done my way on this and this, I need to own that too. Like, it's not just about, well, I have this expectation of someone else and they're not doing it. And so I'm going to do it my way because I do think that there is that while I appreciate that you're calling out a lot of the masculine problems on the divorce side and heteronormative relationships, there's a lot to that women habits drive towards because we get so frustrated and then we just take it back and we do it. Like whether it's rear the children, right? It's like, well, I couldn't trust you to change their diaper, pick them up from school or put a bandaid on for, because you're too rough or because whatever. It's like, no, I love the story that you told about like connecting with your children and them having that bond with you. Like, I got so frightened watching my husband, who was a stay-at-home dad with my kids, like throw my kids up in the air or constantly do things. It's like, that's not how I would parent. But that's his relationship with his children. And they have that bond together. And I have to learn to like accept and let go of that stuff. And I think the inflection point for me was the realization that I was not willing to let go of the things that I was grateful for the things that I really cared about in our relationship, that I could trust him on the things that really mattered in life, that like I couldn't trust him to remember to take the dry cleaning. I couldn't trust him to do the dishes, but I could trust him in the things that like really mattered to me. And for some people, maybe that's not like the important thing for them. But for me, sitting in that gratitude practice and then continuing to have that going forward, to continue to revisit. I have a list of 10 things that I'm grateful for that I revisit every single day. And being in a relationship with someone who values me and who I value and trust is one of the things that's on that list to remind me that it's not just about the chores. It's not just about these things that like we have that deeper connection that I want to be reminded of. That was brilliant. That whole piece, by the way. (laughs) Any No, honestly, and I'm just, I'm not just stroking your ego. I like, I, For anybody out there, listen to that portion again. There's a lot to be learned there. I think one of the most basic things you can do is gratitude. Just say thank you. I really appreciate what you did X. You're super good at blah. I really understand that you're really doing 70% here and I'm not really pulling my weight and I appreciate it. That goes a long way. And it's funny. I think part of being committed to a long-term workable relationship that you know in your heart of hearts, like you said, is worth it. You understand you're a human being. So are they. You're not perfect. Neither are they. There are going to be differences that help make your relationship work and make it great. You're not going to be the same. So I am that hyper OCD person. I am like everything needs to be in its proper place all the time. And my wife a little bit different. Certain things hyper technical to the nth degree. Other things doesn't matter. No big deal. Now, I need to accept that's on me. I'm the guy that's over the top. I can't expect her to be exactly who I am. And I think in return, she doesn't expect me to be exactly who she is. You're not going to do things in the same way. 
And you have to understand it's not going to, they're not going to be perfect. You're not going to create them in your own form and you need to accept them as they are. The funny piece about the childcare is I think early on when I became a dad, I, my wife took over everything right out of the gate. She was doing the diapers. She was doing this and like, and then I'm like, why aren't I doing that? And I think part of it was precipitated by a conversation she, that we had that she was like, hey, I was talking with one of my friends. They were like, oh, now that they're divorced, like dad has the kids half the time, so they have time to themselves. And I don't think she was trying to send me a message at all. It was just like light old conversation. And I was like, and I thought to myself, like, it's pretty powerful. Like, why aren't I giving her time? Like, why aren't, but remember now, that's a give and take, right? When dad says, hey, I'm going to take the kids. And then I started, when they were like two or three, I started like, hey, we're going to go to Home Depot today. I'm going to take both kids. She's like, really? You're going to take a two and a three-year-old to Home Depot with you to run errands? I said, no, you've got some things you maybe you might want to work in the yard. You might want to watch TV program. Whatever. I'm going to take them for a couple hours, no problem. She's like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. There's a trust there, right? But the point is, if you're that committed to that other person, you will trust them in that way that they will do the right thing, that they will be a good parent, not the same one you're going to be, but they love and care about their kids enough to make sure that they take care of the kids well. And again, it's going to be a different thing. So there is a trust there. While yes, guys should be stepping up and yes, ladies need to trust. They're not going to do things exactly the way you do things. It's going to be different. And you know, I would argue that our children have benefited from that, right? Like they get yep. the best of both worlds, so to speak, in those parenting. And they come to me for certain things and they come to dad to certain things. So when you were talking earlier about how the kids have that bond with mom, it reminds me of our relationship as a healthy relationship because our children truly do have a bond with both parents and they know um, both how to work each of us, but also who to come to. Yep. When they really need something, like they know yep. who's going to be the softy. They know who's going to be the, like the one who will give them hugs and support. And me, I'm much more like stern. I'm like, who do I need to fight for you? Like, I'll be that person. And and they'll come to us when they need something, each of us in their own ways. Uh, that so balance for kids is so important to have that balance to have both parents like in whatever form it can be. I can so see, I can see that still being a potential for outside of marriage, also in co-parenting from divorce. Yeah. Like yep. I've talked to divorced families who have a positive co-parenting experience, and that can be absolutely wonderful for the children as well to see two people who are no longer in love, but are still able to manage a positive relationship and to support their children independently, I think that also sends an incredible message to show to children. I think the key is across all of those communication, right? And unfortunately, if you have children and you're divorced, you don't get to stop communicating and being done with someone because if that happens, then your children are really the ones that are suffering. Like there has to be that sense of togetherness. So I'm wondering, if the outcome is divorce, if someone is evaluating for whatever it might be, maybe the partner is not willing to engage and to do more or to accept or to do a lot of these things that we're talking about. What are some of the best practices that you've seen people amicably separate and amicably divorce that leads to a minimally impacted, positive co-parenting couple on the other side of divorce? Yeah, look, the best the best sort of co-parenting situation are the ones where the two parents craft what the agreement will be. They already have an idea on what the lifestyle will be. They know what their kids need, and they're going to communicate a free flow of consistent communication between the two of them. No animosity, no axes to grind, no remnants of the broken relationship. That they're still trying to air between their co-parenting situation with their kids. That's the perfect circumstance. But we don't get that very frequently. Hopefully we'll continue. Let's put it this way. Let me back up a little bit. We do probably about 95, no, probably about 99% litigation. And we probably do about 1% divorce mediation. And we are certified divorce mediators, collaborative divorce attorneys, and we've been doing it for a long time now. It's just that what we find is when people come in the door, they're convinced that as of the, as the relationship has fractured, 
they're, they assume they're not going to be able to work with the person on the other side to have, a, to, have, to have an amicable split. And if you can't have an amicable split, I'm not really quite sure how you're going to be able to co-parent well either. But in those circumstances where you do have toxic people involved in these situations, what you have to remember is, and I think you, you touched on a good point earlier, the most important things is the, are the kids, okay? Your children are the most important thing. So you are trying to work through what can be a very difficult process with a difficult person because you love your kids. There's a number of different techniques you can use there. I think one of the most important things, though, is to remember, do as much on your side as you can. So I just had a, somebody on my podcast talking about a co-parenting journal. And one of, the, one of the questions that I asked the conversation that we had is, if you have a toxic person on the other side who's not willing to participate, couldn't you just do this yourself with your kid? Yeah, you can. You can do journaling. You can do counseling. You can involve in activities. You can do as much. You can organize all the school and do all of the things that the other party is going to give you a hard time with. Try to do as much on your side as you can, because at the end of the day, it's not about getting back at the person on the other side. It's about benefiting your kid. I am curious what a positive, actionable suggestion that we can leave listeners today. So maybe they're feeling like they've either been divorced or they know someone or whatever. What is something that they can take away today to take on to either work on themselves, work on their relationship, work on whatever so that they can feel accomplished instead of overwhelmed from listening to the show? I think, again, I think the most important thing is probably a little bit more philosophical than anything else. It's about keeping the big picture in mind, okay? I think people are so worried about, there's so many resources out there for you to help you learn about the divorce process, and your attorneys can help you work through that. Your counselors can help you work with the counseling. But for you and your heart of hearts, you need to know that this is a turn of a page in your life, and your whole future is ahead of you. Now it's time to figure out, look, Career or not, what's your passion? What do you love to do? Do the simple things. Spend time with your kids. Look at your life like this is a start. I think so many people fear divorce because they look at it as an end. And there's two different ways to do it. If you look at the divorce like, hey, okay, divorce. Now, what happened with the fractured relationship? Are there things that I, un baggage that I need to unpack with myself? Maybe drawing back to my childhood to learn more about myself? Mm-hmm. Are there things we can learn about that relationship and why I attracted this personality that ended up not working for me? Yes. What have we learned from those two things and how can I look for the right person moving forward if that's what you so choose? And again, career, family, future. Keep in mind, you're looking on that horizon and your future is on that horizon. Don't get inundated with all little day-to-day -day stressors because you will get, but it's funny, Somebody described the divorce process to me as like being on a roller coaster. And I said, it absolutely is. But remember, it's a roller coaster ride that you will get off of. You will survive it. You'll get off of it. And you will learn from the experience and you'll be better for the experience. Well, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today, Dennis. Can you remind listeners where they can find you? You can check out our social media is at DRV Law, the, DV, the DRV Law podcast, the DRV Law Show. Also, if somebody is in the downstate New York area and they need assistance with their divorce or their family law case, drvitranolaw.com is our law office. But again, try to do the mediation because I really want to want to try to keep that aggravation and timetable and acrimony down. Absolutely. Listeners, thank you so much for your willingness to be listened through to our unique show today, but hopefully it will help us all avoid the potential negative health and wellness outcomes of these difficult situations longer term. We put a list of resources for you at the show notes at realerything.com. And I want to remind you that if you did enjoy the show today, leaving a review costs you nothing but just 30 seconds of your time and makes a huge difference in my being able to continue to do this work. And don't forget to follow or subscribe in whatever podcast app you're using. As always, we appreciate your willingness to 
be open to growth for your own personal changes because no one is perfect. But in listening, learning, and unlearning, we can choose to become better versions of ourselves for ourselves. Dennis, thank you so much for being here. And listeners, we'll be back again next week. Great to be here. Thanks again.